Hi everyone. Today we're going to continue to discuss Japan in the modern age, especially the extraordinary transformations that took place in the Meiji era. This is part two of a lecture where we will talk about various parts of the artistic landscape. In the first part, we looked at sort of some of the arts like Kabuki that tried to sort of hold on to the traditional past, whereas many others were just kind of swept away. For example, I want to show you a small object that I found in a estate sale some years ago. This was a rather strange little piece of hardwood with these ivory tabs inserted in the ivory tabs were small pieces of shell that were sort of shaped and cut like tiny bugs. It was kind of a lovely little piece, but I had no idea what it was. With some research, we were able to identify this as a whist counter. A whist was a very popular card game at the turn of the last century. And one of the ways in which traditional craftsmen who had made lacquer boxes and other fine Japanese works, which were no longer in demand, as people were flooded the market with Western goods, traditional craftsmen took up making whist counters. And these rather lovely objects were used to keep score in this sort of bridge-like game. They're just beautifully made. They're wonderfully uh, designed. And they show the sort of attempt to try and maintain skills and ideas and sort of desperate attempt to find some new markets that they could exploit with their exceptional talents. For the most part, traditional arts were in decline. People were finding it very difficult to find work, make the skills that they had developed in cutting and shaping bamboo and inlay and things like that were just not in demand. One of the people who came to sort of the rescue of the arts, the traditional arts of Japan, was a man by the name of Okakuro Kazuro, who studied. One of the people who came to the rescue of the traditional arts in Japan was Okakuro Kakuzo, who was a man of exceptional learning who studied in the West, and he was worked with Western scholars and began to sort of catalog the history of Japanese art and began to sort of educate uh, museums and collectors about what was valuable and try and preserve in Japan a lot of these quote, national treasures. He sort of created this category and encouraged the government to begin to protect them. He traveled the country and identified extraordinary works of art that were sort of growing old and dusty in Buddhist monasteries around the country. And he sort of brought them under the umbrella of this sort of national treasure. And this is something that Japan continues to do today. They even have a category for intangible national treasures, people who have skills and people who have knowledge that is a very important part of transmitting this traditional culture. Okakura Kakuzo wrote um, a very influential book, uh, The Book of Tea, in which he outlines this idea of these unique Japanese aesthetics and he uses the tea ceremony as a way to address some of these uh, deep-rooted aesthetic ideas that he finds in Japan. Another important scholar was Yanagi Soetsu, 
who was a real lover of traditional arts and wrote a book called The Unknown Craftsman, a series of essays on art and culture from Japan. He really celebrated the folk art he called minge, and he wanted to preserve these as well as the fine art. He wrote a very influential essay on this important tibo, the Kisiman uh, tibo from Korea. And in it, he compared these uh, extraordinary objects of antiquity with the sort of modern counterparts. And he said that this, the kind of aesthetic response we need to appreciate this beautiful tea bowl is very much the same as the kind of aesthetic response that we see in objects around us, that the number of things that are being made uh, it doesn't necessarily even need to be handmade. There are ways in which we can appreciate things of our lives with a kind of understanding that they sort of transcend beauty or the intent even to make something beautiful. These ideas and the celebration of folk art became a very important touchstone for a new revival of traditional arts, especially ceramics. Shoji Hamada began to find ways to sort of blend traditional craft of ceramics with a little bit more contemporary, looser um, styling that, that allowed them to appeal to more uh, contemporary sensibilities. A very important American came to Japan in the 1920s and 30s, Bernard Leach would uh, study ceramics in Japan, and he was very influential in coming back to the U.S., convincing art departments that ceramics was an art. It wasn't just a craft or a in industrial art, you know, something used in manufacturing, which is the way most people at this time, but he wanted to impress people from the Japanese example that these objects were artworks in and of themselves. It would still take many, many decades um, from this time before ceramics would really come into its own as a unique work of art. But he established this as a, a valid area of study in the university, and this was very important uh, for ceramic departments all over the U.S. We can see again in this example here by Tomimoto Kenichi this sense of a traditional design, a kind of shape and form that was Japanese, but now in a kind of looser, more expressive uh, forms that give it a kind of modern sensibility. And this is how the, some of the traditional arts in Japan were able to sustain themselves during this transition. I now want to talk about, at the same time as these transitions in traditional folk cultures were happening, there was a desire to create new Western style painting that kind of move away from making art in traditional forms and formats, and that there was something essential about Western civilization that Japan needed to learn through Western style painting. The Meiji Art Society was one of the first to really investigate this idea of Western style painting. Uh, they really took their ideas from the sort of French Barbizon school of painting, which is to go outside into the countryside and paint ordinary people and everyday scenery as a way to kind of touch the core of the essence of a people, not to talk about high subjects or grand narratives. The idea was to get to something more real, more focused on the here and the now. These sort of earth in brown colors and this, this sense of the what was really happening in the countryside of Japan was the focus of this Meiji art society. Perhaps one of the most influential of artists to study in Europe and to come back and take up Western style painting uh, 
was Kurodo Seki. Kurodo Seki was a fairly wealthy man who came from a well-heeled family, went off to Europe originally to study law, and while he was there, became infatuated with painting and shifted his focus and began to study under the masters in France. He really took up a lot more of an interest in the more contemporary painting styles of France, the Impressionists, you can see that in his work, Maiko Girl, which he painted after he returned from his 10 year uh, stint in Paris in 1893. He begins the White Horse Society and with them they are sort of trying to encourage this new, more vibrant style of painting that involved sort of going out in the open air, the sort of plein air uh, painting tradition. Painting Western style art was meant to revive Japanese arts, was meant to show the future, to encourage a new kind of objectivity and to project a sense of confidence uh, being in the world and having a real uh, mature art style, just like all the other great nations of the world. And so there is a great deal of a sort of ambition to create art that is in this way Western, at the same time clearly project Japanese culture. So he does this in Maiko Girl, the woman in the kimono, is in the center, and is very much, you know, a real person in this environment. We see the light, we see the feel, the, the textures of the fabric. It's a beautifully vibrant painting. And people, this really appealed to people much more than the kind of muted earth tones, Barbizon school of the earlier Western style paintings. And so the White Horse Society found some success in its attempt to kind of introduce Japan to impressionist style painting. Kurosaki's morning toilet was perhaps his most controversial painting. It was actually painted while he was in Paris. It was only exhibited uh, in Japan a few times. Uh, the first in Tokyo, where it was not terribly remarked upon, the modern city of Tokyo, but when it was exhibited in Kyoto, the sort of heart of traditional Japan, it created quite a stir. Of course, the question was at this time, is the exhibition of a naked woman uh, educational? Is it uh, helpful or is it disruptive and, and counterproductive? the way in which people were accepting Western culture and Western ideas was sort of challenging some of the basic values of Japanese culture, but also uh, a very important idea of propriety, something that had come up in British culture, especially where there was a great deal of censorship of things about nude painting. And so there was a sense that this is not entirely correct way to adopt Westernist, Western style painting is to sort of uncritically adopt this. And the way to do that would be to try and move in a way that we sort of accept certain parts and perhaps reject others. Here's another painting by Kuro de Seki from 1897. In this we see this woman at the lakeside. And I just want to point out the beautiful light that he has created in this painting, the sense of space that proceeds back from the figure in the foreground. But also he has this straight horizon that cuts across the picture plane, much like you could see in a landscape by Hiroshiga, that way in which the picture is both flat and dimensional. It's not quite as dramatic as Hiroshiga, but it still is an asymmetrical composition. It still embodies a lot of the ideas of Japanese traditional arts. At the same time, it's projecting this kind of new, modern, 
impressionist treatments and characteristics sort of looking at it with fresh realistic eyes I want to talk about an, a writer Junichiro Tanizaki who wrote a wonderful essay is called In Praise of Shadow 1933 and it he took uh, to criticize the adoption of Western style art uncritically. I mean, there was a beginning at this point a kind of pushback against the sort of wholesale ad adoption of Western tastes and the rejection of all things Japanese. I, I bring this up because he has this really sort of funny, quirky, perhaps even a sarcastic way of going about this. And he talks about shadows and darkness and him praising them. He's also talking about uh, just how sort of backwards a lot of Japan still is, uh, but that there may be virtue in the rustic and in the shadowed, in the not illuminating. And even though Western culture seems to always drive toward uh, improving, making things brighter and cleaner, there may be something in that is lost when we dispel all the shadows. And so he wants to keep us in this sense, a kind of reflection of who we are and who they have been as we approach this. And so in the mansion called literature, I would have the eaves deep and the walls dark. I'd push back into the shadows, the things that come forward too clearly. I would strip away useless decoration. And so he's sort of asking people in our artworks not to lose sight of that important capacity to envelop ourselves in that world of shadow from the past. We can see that perhaps not directly this was uh, painted many years earlier but that sense of self-reflection and that sense of enveloping darkness in these paintings by Kinshu Rose. He was a part of a later generation of yoga style artists who were more critical of adopting the sort of mainstream Western painting and really felt there should be something more authentically Japanese. He painted a great many self-portraits as well as these paintings of his daughter where he is trying to sort of peer into these people, uh, their sensibilities, uh, to, to then closely observe their natures in a way that allows him to kind of self-reflect on who he is and sort of what is his values are. The world was upended dramatically during the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake. Um, this just leveled the modern city of Tokyo and many other surrounding towns. And with this massive devastation and this huge loss of life, there was a desperate need to rebuild. The earthquake happened uh, just before noon on September 1st, 1923. Various accounts hold that the duration of the earthquake was between four and 10 minutes. The Kanto quake killed between 100,000 and 140,000 people, making it the deadliest earthquake ever to strike Japan. Now, Part of the devastation here was the earthquake, the crumbling of the buildings, the fires that broke out in the cities, but also there were groups of military or paramilitary groups that went around executing their opponents. And so there was a fierce consolidation of power. There were also a great deal of misinformation that was put out at this time targeting Koreans living in Japan. Korean murder victims alone ranged between 2,500 to 6,600. About 360 Japanese civilians were eventually charged for murder, attempted murder, manslaughter, and assault. However, most of those who were 
brought to trial or let off with most nominal sentences. And so with this great devastation, there was a, a huge urge to rebuild and a need to rebuild. And so they relaxed a lot of the zoning laws and many new groups came in and rebuilt at this time. For one was a new Western style theater. Other artists began to occupy um, these spaces and rebuild spaces. And so the society began to rebuild uh, with openings for these more avant-garde activities. The avant-garde in Japan was always marginalized as the government uh, was shifting more and more militaristically and more and more fascistically. There was uh, these artists who were socialists, communists, who really wanted to change society in the opposite direction. They uh, often would find themselves on the wrong side of the law. This is what we have. Here's uh, some of the early examples of a kind of modern art in the vein of constructivism, and which is a new art movement out of Russia and Italy. And here you can see the attempt to sort of manipulating characters and graphics in a very exciting, explosive and um, constructivist manner. One art group that emerged at this time was Mavo. Now, the group Mavo is interesting for many reasons, but let's just look at their name. Uh, Mavo includes the, the English character V, which doesn't even exist in the Japanese language. So right there, there's this idea that they're trying to introduce something that doesn't exist. They're trying to bring something into being, introduce it in a way that it becomes a part of the new vocabulary of what it means to be a modern Japan. And so this also is kind of a reference to this idea of nonsense, things that are incomprehensible, like the Dada groups of Europe, and much of the kind of uh, performative and theatrical events that they put on would have a, a kind of hearkening back to some of those ideas of Dada art. Mavo came out with a manifesto and their own letterhead and uh, their own poster designs. And they were very much about promoting themselves. They saw this idea of an art movement as a way to kind of band together like-minded artists and to try and create a sense of uh, excitement or energy about their new ideas. Here you see uh, paintings by Murayama Tomoyoshi, which is called Dedicated to All the Beautiful Young Girls, sort of mixed media in the vein of Kurt Schwitters. We can even see a kind of German on the left there and that sense of the sort of nonsense numbers at the top. It's a way of kind of introducing, you know, typographics and color fields and shifting planes in this sort of exciting, dynamic way. Two of the main artists of Mavo were Murayama Tomoyoshi and his wife Murayama Kaisuko. And together, they uh, often wore the same clothes, had the same haircut, and they adopted a kind of gender neutral uh, way of being as a way of kind of projecting themselves as works of art and the idea of being uh, a new modern society that didn't differentiation be differentiate between male and female. You can see here Moriyama Kasuko uh, doing a kind of expressionist dance. They also had a kind of art building, again, because of the Kanto earthquake, they were able to kind of paint and decorate and redesign their studios in this sort of exciting, crazy, avant-garde sort of way. They also took this wagon here and fixed, fixed it up with a number of uh, sculptures and signs and paintings to create a kind of futurist vehicle. The gate and moving ticket selling machine from 1925. 
Murayama himself would be persecuted by the police, arrested in 1930 and 1932, and again in 1940. Sort of repeated arrests were the kind of ongoing harassment of the avant garde, and as the military began to feel more and more suspicious of people who weren't sort of towing the line. Another artist from this time, Yanunsi Masumo, was taken into police custody for five days and repeatedly beaten. You can see here the sort of socialist, activist, futurist. Uh, style of his art that would have seen as very provocative to the officials of Japan. 